let's talk about the allowance method. Imagine you're a firm and you're making a sale. Sometimes the customer will pay you in cash and sometimes they'll say, I'll pay you later. That's what's known as accounts receivable. But what happens if not everyone pays us the money that they owe us? There are two methodologies for writing off receivables when the customers don't pay. The first one is what's known as the specific write-off method, and this is rarely used, so we'll skip that. The second methodology is what's known as the allowance method, and it's an indirect write-off method. It involves two steps. Step one, you're going to make an estimation at the time of the sale about the amount you expect to not be collected. And step two, you're going to think about the actual write-off which will occur later. So the question becomes, well, how do we make the estimation for the amount? There are two methodologies for doing so. The first one is what's known as percentage of credit sales. So this is a one-step system where the uncollectible account expense is calculated directly as percent of net sales. The second methodology is what's known as aging of receivables. Under the aging of receivables, it's a two-step system. First, you're going to solve for the ending allowance for uncollectible accounts. This is the sum of accounts receivable that are deemed uncollectible. And then in the second step, we'll solve for the uncollectible account expense. So let's do a couple of examples. The first one with percentage of credit sales. On March 3rd, Bite Size Q&A company performed $10,000 of service. They received $2,000 in cash and rest on credit. Based on prior experience, 5% of credit sales won't be collected. So let's think about what happened on March 3rd. First, they have the credit sale. Well, they receive $2,000 in cash, but recorded $10,000 in service revenue. So the difference between the two, the $8,000 is what they expect to receive in the future, and that's accounts receivable. Next, they're going to estimate how much they expect to not collect. So based on their prior experience, 5% of credit sales won't be collected. So the question is, is it 5% of $10,000, the total revenue, or 5% of accounts receivable? It's actually 5% of accounts receivable, so 5% of $8,000 or $400. Why? Because we already received $2,000 in cash, so that cash we have in hand already, so we know that amount is guaranteed. What's uncertain is the collection of the $8,000. With the computation done, now we can do our journal entries. We're going to debit uncollectible account expense for $400 and credit allowance for uncollectible account contra asset account for $400. So now that we have the journal entry, let's think about what it's really trying to tell you on the balance sheet. So on the balance sheet, we know that we expect to collect $8,000, so that's our gross accounts receivable. But because we know that some people won't pay us back, we have to reduce that amount. The amount that we reduce it by is the allowance for uncollectible amount of $400. So really we're expecting to collect $7,600 and this is our net accounts receivable. Next, let's work on an example for aging of receivables. On December 31st, Bitesize Q&A had a balance of $770,000 in its accounts receivable account and an unused balance of $7,000 in its allowance for uncollectible accounts. The company then analyzed and aged its accounts receivables as follows. Total accounts receivable, $770. A current portion has $460,000. 
One to sixty days past due has two hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. 61 to 180 days past due has $38,000, and over 180 days past due has $20,000. In the past, the company experienced losses as follows. 1% of current balance, 5% of balance 1 to 60 days past due, 15% of balances 61 to 180 days past due, and 40% of balances over 180 days past due. The company bases its provision for credit losses on the aging's analysis. What can we do? Well, the first thing that we can do to solve for the uncollectible account expense is to have everything in a table form. We have our accounts receivable divided into current and the past due dates with the amount and percent uncollectible. Now we can actually compute the amount that's uncollectible. For example, for the $468,000 that are current, we estimated that 1% won't be collected. So 468,000 times 1% is $4,680. For the $244,000 that's between 1 and 60 days past due, the firm estimates that 5% won't be collected, so 244,000 times 5% is $12,200. For the $38,000 that are between 61 to 180 days past due, 15% won't be collected, so that amounts to 38,000 times 15% or 5,700. Finally, there are $20,000 that are over 180 days past due, and 40% will be collected. So 20,000 times 40%, or $8,000, won't be collected. So if we were to add 4680 plus 12,200 plus 5,700 plus 8,000, we would get the total amount to be $30,580. So that is the total amount that's not expected to be collected. We also know that the beginning allowance balance is $7,000. So now we can do a T account to help us. Allowance for uncollectible account is a contra asset account. So that means it reduces our account's receivable asset. Because it's a contra asset, the beginning balance is on the right-hand side. So we have $7,000 of beginning balances here. In our first step, what did we do? Well, we saw for the ending balance of $30,580. So that's our step one. Then step two, we have to solve for the uncollectible account expense. 30580 minus $7,000 equals to $23,580. So the journal entries would be debit uncollectible account expense 23580 credit allowance for uncollectible account contra asset account $23,580. Now let's go back to our percent of credit sales example and think about a write-off. So on March 3rd, Bite Size Q&A company performed $10,000 of service. They received $2,000 in cash and rest on credit. Based on prior experience, 5% of credit sales won't be collected. So this looks the same as before. What's new? Well, on September 1st, Random Co. declared bankruptcy and won't be able to pay $300. So now we can think about what happened on September 1st, where Random Pay declared the bankruptcy. So if they're not paying, then this is when we have the write-off. When we have a write-off, we're not expecting to receive the accounts receivable anymore. Hence, we will credit accounts receivable for $300. Note that earlier on March 3rd, we had created the allowance for uncollectible account contra asset account. So that is the account from which we will be debiting. 
There are a couple of accounts that are very important here. The first one is accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is an asset, so the beginning balance on the T account appears on the left-hand side. What affects it? Well, first is credit sale. When a firm makes a credit sale, they'll debit accounts receivable and credit revenue, so the amount that goes for the credit sale gets put on the left-hand side of the T account. Next, we have receipt from customers. When customers pay the firm, cash will go up, and we can credit accounts receivable, so receipt from the customers will reduce our accounts receivable account, so it's put on the right-hand side. Now we have learned about the write-off. When there's a write-off, we no longer expect to receive our accounts receivable, so accounts receivable gets credited, and we debit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. So on our gross receivable T account, the write-off amount is on the right-hand side. And then we can compute the ending balance. Ending balance equals to beginning balance plus credit sales minus receipt from customers minus the write-off. The other account that's very important is the allowance for uncollectible accounts. Because it's a contra asset, its beginning balance is going to be on the right-hand side. What affects it? The first is the estimation of the uncollectible amount. So here we will debit uncollectible account expense and credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts, contra asset account. So therefore, the amount that we put for the estimation of the uncollectibles gets put onto the right-hand side of our allowance for uncollectible accounts, contra asset account. We also have the write-off. When there's a write-off, remember, we are going to debit allowance for uncollectible accounts and credit accounts receivable. So the write-off amount gets put on the left-hand side of our allowance for uncollectible accounts. And then we can solve for the ending balance. So the ending balance equals to the beginning balance plus estimation of uncollectibles minus the write-off. This might look a little bit complicated, but if you really think about it, there are just a few account names that appear over and over again. First, we have accounts receivable because we are thinking about credit sales. Then we have uncollectible account expense that occurs during the estimation of the amount that we don't expect to collect. And associated with both of them is the allowance for uncollectible accounts, contra asset account. And just for the sake of completeness, we also can have cash and revenue. There are always entries that are associated with each other. So first, let's think about the uncollectible account expense and the allowance for uncollectible accounts. This occurs during the estimation uh, process. Then when we have a write-off, we have debit allowance for uncollectible accounts and credit for accounts receivable. And then finally, if we're getting cash from our customer, we're going to debit cash credit accounts receivable. One question you may have is, why do we bother using the allowance method? This seems so complicated. Why don't we just write off the uncollectible account expense at the time of write-off? Why are we doing this whole estimation business? Well, take a look at the time of the sale. When we have a credit sale, we're crediting revenue. At the same time, you're going to estimate uncollectible account expense. So this goes back to our matching principle. At the time of the sale, we're matching the expense with the revenue it's helping to generate. And this is why IRFRS and US GAAP both want the allowance method to be used. And with that, you know all about the allowance method.